Again, it is good to see everyone out this morning. Some of you may have noticed that uh, I did not partake of the Lord's Supper this morning. I know that we have several visitors. So I was at 6 a.m. service this morning. Brother Jerry did a fine job speaking on Galatians chapter 5, the works of the flesh versus the fruit of the Spirit. And I appreciate his study in doing that. And also Brother Ron gets in there and appreciate both of those men for their willingness to study and to learn, especially being relatively new Christians, and we appreciate that. I'll also mention that uh, tomorrow, if you are available at 10.30 a.m., you can tune in to www.fhu.edu and click on the live chapel link at 10.30, and I am blessed to be able to stand before the student body tomorrow and uh, deliver a lesson. There's only one problem with speaking at Free Hardeman and Derrick Chapel. They only give me 15 minutes to speak. And most of you all realize 15 minutes is, is not near long enough for me, but we'll make the best of it. But uh, I appreciate the honor of being able to do that. Brother Charlie read for us from Philippians chapter 3 and verse 13, where Paul speaks this idea of forgetting the things in the past and reaching forward to that which is in the future. And so this morning, based on that phrase, forgetting, and that one word, forgetting, I want to encourage us about five things that we should not forget. Memory for all of us is a two-edged sword. Oftentimes, our memory allows us to remember things that we should forget. But at other times, our memory will not bring to our remembrance things that we should remember. And so when I think about this particular thought about not forgetting. Perhaps it is as we grow older we revert back to our childhood because all of us can remember I hope. Do you remember, I'll just ask, do you remember hearing the words do not do and a fill in the blank? Any of y'all ever any y'all remember that? <clears throat> How many of you remember listening and not forgetting to do that? Or how many of you forgot that mom or dad said, don't do that? I would venture if you're, and I'm going to go back to an old phrase, if you are honest with yourself, you have to admit that I violated remembering that mom or dad said do not do something. Because as children, we do that. But now as we grow older, unfortunately, there are things that we wish we could remember. Okay, where is the remote control for the TV? Have you seen my phone? Well, you know, now with the new smartwatch and the smartphones that can communicate with each other, I can go on my watch. You're not going to hear it beep because my phone is in my office. But on the bottom down here, there's a little button and it it's, it's, uh, looks like a little phone. And if you push that button, it beeps. I'm never going to lose my phone again. I thought I did the I thought I did the other night and I pushed the little button in case I what was that? So I'm trying to find my phone. We do forget things, right? But there are five things from God's word that you and I better not forget. When Paul says he forgot about the things of the past, he's speaking about the life that he once lived as the persecutor of God's people. But now 
moment he says that he reaches forward to the things which are ahead. Paul is going to remember these principles because it is the principles we look at today and that we do not forget that will help us as we press toward, as Brother Greg prayed, as we press toward that prize. As we reach forward for the prize of the upward call of God in verse 14. So let's begin about those things which we need not forget. Number one, do not forget God. If we go back to the Old Testament in Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 11, Moses through the Spirit records these words. He says, Beware that you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping His commandments, His judgments, and His statutes, which I command you today. Brother, how many original commandments did God give? How many, how many original commandments did God give? Ten? Ten, right? And then man added additional things to make that law more restrictive. And Brother Jerry, you said there were 600 some. If I remember, if, if I remember correctly, there are 619 different commands listed in the Old Testament. Do not forget God. Brethren, in our world today, when we forget about God, we forget about the basis for living an ethical and moral life. When you go back and you look at the Ten Commandments, those things are morally and ethically correct. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not commit adultery. And so on and so forth in those commandments. Those are both moral and ethical. The moral side is how we live our lives. The ethical side is how we reach out and how we treat others. What is the golden rule? Do unto others as you what? Would have them do unto you. Brethren, when we do those things, when we treat others like we want to be treated, we will remember who God is because it is the basis of the commandments in which we remember God. But let us understand also, when we fail to remember about God, when we forget God, we are doomed to a life that leads to eternal ruin. When we forget God, we are destined to fail. When we forget God, we are destined to be ruled by self. And self-rule is not good rule. Brethren, we must remember who God is. And I know I could probably make a whole sermon about not forgetting God. But let us remember two things. Well, three things. God has always been. God is always with us. And God will see to it that we have a future with Him. In the beginning was... What? God. In the beginning, God created the heavens. Brethren, if we forget God, we forget our beginning. And if we fail to understand our beginning, I promise you, you will never understand your ending. 
you will never understand the magnificent plans God has for you in the future. Number two this morning, do not forget what sin costs us. When you and I fall into the trap of sin, when we forget God, and we sin against Him because we know that sin defined is transgression of the law. What does sin cost us? What does Romans 6 and verse 23 say? For the wages of sin is what? Death. death. What death? What death is the wage of sin? Have you really thought about that word death there? Probably should have another word in front of it. The wages of sin is eternal death. And that eternal death is that which will separate us from God in eternity. Boy, but I'm thankful the last part of the verse says, but the gift of God is eternal life. Or perhaps we go back to Matthew chapter 16 and we look at verse 26. What is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his whole soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? If I were to go around this assembly this morning, and I passed each of you a little note card. And I said to you, okay, on this note card, I, I want you to put your, your name. And I want you to write down what would you give? What would you trade? What would you exchange for your soul? What would you write now? I would pray that you would write down a seven letter word. Y'all got the seven? You got seven letter word in your mind already? I'll give you a hint. It begins with an N. You want another hint? It ends with a G. What would you give in exchange for your soul? I would pray that everyone in this assembly this morning would write down the word nothing. There's nothing this world has to offer that is more valuable than your soul. Brother Ray, why is my soul so important? Your soul is important, number one, because the Bible says, the Bible says that God spoke and said, let us create man in our image. Your soul is valuable because it's made in the image of God, number one. Number two, your soul is valuable because of what we commemorated earlier around this table. Your soul is valuable because your soul, and I'm being specific, your soul cost heaven its greatest treasure. Your soul cost God to send His Son to give His life on a cruel cross where He bled and died for you. What is your soul worth? And we could go on. But let us understand Sin will take you where you do not want to go. Sin will lead you down a path 
that you do not want to travel. Sin will keep you longer than you want to stay. Sin is not some overnight excursion. Sin is an excursion which will lead you away for a lot longer than you want to. And brethren, finally, sin will cost you more than you want to pay. I don't remember the first time I heard that quote. Perhaps you've heard many preachers say something similar. But as I think about that quote, where does sin take you? What does sin keep you away from? And what will sin cost you? Brethren, sin takes us to the bottom. Sin takes us to the lowest of lows. And the goal of Satan and his army is to keep us in the lowest of lows. Freddie's not in here right now, but I'm calling him out. He'll pop his head around the corner when he hears his name. Sin took Freddie out of the church for a long time, brother. It kept you in the lowest of lows. Something, something allowed Freddie to see that the price he was paying was too great. Y'all remember that day? Y'all remember that day when he walked right down this aisle? Y'all remember the day when, when, when Chandra walked down that aisle about a month ago? You remember that Wednesday night when, when Philip walked down this aisle? Brethren, they said, Satan, sin, you have entrapped me for too long. You've cost me more than I am willing to pay. And they said, it's time to let go and reach out and let God take over again. Amen. I could go around this assembly this morning and I could name many who have done that. We all did it at one point when we stepped out we stepped out of that pew and we came to the front and we were asked the greatest question ever to be asked. Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? And we answered in the affirmative, yes. And maybe the preacher said, God bless you for your confession. Let's prepare to baptize you into Christ. Then we stepped down. Y anybody, any of y'all remember the day you were baptized? You remember that day? Remember what sin will cost you. Remember what Jesus did to pay the price for you. Number three this morning. Do not forget all of God's benefits. We did a whole sermon on, on this at one point about a year or so ago. But just to bring to your memory, don't forget all His benefits. Look at the psalmist. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits. Or James chapter 1 and verse 17, Every good and perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turn. What are the benefits of God? James says every good and perfect gift. What is the most perfect gift you've ever received in your life? What is that perfect gift? Let's take Jesus out of the equation for a minute. Because I know some of you are thinking the greatest gift I have is the gift of, of, of the love of God through Jesus Christ. That is the greatest gift. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. But in, in, a, in physical 
wife, what's the greatest gift you've ever received? What's the greatest thing since sliced bread? What is it? What's well, different for all of us, isn't it? The greatest gift given is the gift of Jesus. And we know that the Old Testament speaks about Jesus, the coming one. The Gospel records speaks about Jesus, the dwelling one, the one who has existed in the world. And then from the book of Acts all the way through Revelation, Jesus is what? The coming one. So when you think about the greatest gift, we have the Bible who reveals the mind, or which reveals the mind of God. And it speaks to us about the great lengths, about the great gift of Jesus who's coming into our world. Don't forget His blessings. Do we have a habit of that? Do we have a habit of forgetting the benefits of God. And I know some of y'all are looking at that quote up there. God's gifts are good, but be careful. Don't confuse what is good with that that is pleasant. What do you mean? Are there certain things that exist in the world that brings us a pleasant season of time <coughs> and we think that's good but what happens to the pleasant season of time isn't it like the flowers that bloom in the spring and then they fade away how many times do we remember God when the times are going good. Is it easy to remember God when everything's rolling along smoothly? Is it? Or is it easy to for, is it easy to forget who he is? But what about in the times when that pleasantry of life is over and the difficulties of life begin? Do we become more dependent upon God? Do we try to remember who He is and what He has done and how He has given us benefits? Rather than see, that's the illustration. Don't confuse good with pleasant. I suggest to you, and y'all can run me out of town tomorrow. I you run me out of town this afternoon if you want to. I promise you, we are made we become who we are when the challenges of life are difficult. It is in the challenges of life that those who are around about us will be able to see God, will be able to see Christ living in us. Don't forget the benefits. Number four, don't forget His Word. The psalmist David in Psalm 119 and verse 16 says, I will delight myself in your statutes. I will not forget your word. But sadly, brethren, those of the children of Israel, those of the old time, when you look to Hosea chapter 4 and verse 6, one of the saddest statements in Scripture when God says, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. And I quote that part of the verse quite often, but notice what the rest of the verse says. It says, because you have rejected knowledge, I will reject you from being priests for me. Because you have forgotten the law of your God, I also will forget your children. I saw a statistic the other day and I about passed out. And it dealt with our children. When daddy goes to church, 93% of 
of children will remain faithful. Y'all let that, let that sink in. When daddy goes to church, 93% of young people will remain faithful. What happens when the male figure, the father, does not think church is important? What happens to the children? They're a whole lot more likely to become unfaithful. That's probably the reverse. 93% will become unfaithful. I didn't see a statistic on that. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. We must dig into the Word and learn. Amos chapter 8 and verse 11. The Scripture says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord God, that I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread nor thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. I realize that prophecy was written in the Old Testament. But do we see a famine in the land today? Do we see this spiritual famine in our land? Brethren, we have the Word of God. Which reveals to us, as I've already said, the very mind of Christ. It tells us how to live and how to get to heaven. We must seek the knowledge within it. And then point number five this morning. Do not forget that a day is as a thousand years to the Lord. So it says, Brother Ray, why, why do you have that particular point up there? Well, that comes straight from the Scripture, 1 Peter chapter 3, and verse 8. But the whole point of that Scripture and this thought is to remind us Jesus is coming again. Whether you're ready or not, Jesus is coming again. And to the Lord, one day can be a thousand years. Which just very simply means God is not on your timetable or my timetable. How many of you as a child remember playing hide and go seek? That was always a, a favorite of ours when we were at my grandparents' house up in Michigan. I don't think Kay ever got to experience the old farmhouse, which had all these different compartmental rooms. You know, you'd go through one door and you didn't know where you were going. But boy, there were some good hiding places. And you could hear your cousins as we were upstairs. They count one, two, six, ten. Ready or not, here I come. God's not going to count the ten and say, ready or not, here I come. God is going to say, ready or not, I'm on the way. You're either prepared or you're unprepared. That's what, that's what Peter is speaking of when he speaks about this term in a relative sense. You and I. We must stay in a solid state of readiness. Back in the judgment scene in Matthew 24, we go back there and the words of Jesus are so clear. He says, watch, therefore, for you do not know what hour the Lord is coming. You do not know the hour of the Lord is coming. Therefore, in verse 44, therefore also are you also be ready. 
For the Son of Man is coming in an hour when you do not expect Him. Go back to the Old Testament and think about the Passover. Whom did who did the Lord pass over on that day? You can answer that question. You'll understand what it means to be prepared. The ones who the Lord passed over the night of the Passover feast, or the, the Passover, were those who had prepared in the proper way, blood on the doorpost and blood on the lintel. The ones that had that, the Lord passed over. The ones that did not have that, the Lord took the life. Brother, are you prepared this morning? So as we close out our lesson, these things, and, and, and I know I could have come up with a whole bunch more, but I think these five are things that are important for us to remember if we want to have that successful outcome. But remember, we forget God doesn't. God does not forget. He knows our righteousness as well as our unrighteousness. When we ask Him to forgive us of sin, He remembers that no more. But as we sin and we are unrepentant of Him, of them, He will remember those. And those are the things we're going to be judged by in the day of judgment. This morning we have one who needs to come and, be, and put Christ on in baptism and have your sins washed away so that you can begin the walk of a Christian life or this morning do we have those who have been baptized into Christ, but you've simply forgotten. You've simply forgotten. And you need your memory to come back about what God can do for you. This morning you can come repenting of sin, confessing those sins. Will you let us pray with you? Pray for you. Whatever your need may be, we pray you come while we stand and while we sing.